short week, so I'm sure you're all busy, so I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be with you here today. Uh, before I, I jump into our conversation about content marketing and strategy implementation, I'm going to go ahead and, and share my SlideShare address. It's slideshare.net forward slash Liam Dempsey. I just put that in the chat. Today's slides will be available on that address moments after our conversation today. Uh, they're not up there yet, but they'll be up there 10, 15 minutes or so at the most after, after we talk today. Um, if you do have questions, as Sarah said, please go ahead and put them in the chat box. Uh, I'll be trying to keep an eye on that, and uh, I'm sure Sarah will, will, will flag things up to me as well if I, if I miss any or too many that go by. So let's get into content marketing and strategy uh, and talk about uh, implementation too. Okay. So those of you who have joined us over the last few months, you'll, you'll have seen uh, this screen before. But for those who are new, I think it makes sense to give a bit of context just so, because we're not in the same room, to, to you, for you to understand who, who I expect is my audience today. I imagine that you're a director or an employee of a charity and that within that role you're involved in some way with marketing. You're here today because you really want to get a better understanding of online marketing and you want to look for ways to make sure that your nonprofit or charity is more effective with your online marketing efforts. So that's, that's who this presentation is going to be pitched at. And if that's not you and you have questions and you want something explained in a, in a simpler way or perhaps a bit more complex way, that, that's okay too. Just shoot, shoot us a message in the chat and we'll accommodate as best we can. I'm going to try to take about 40 minutes, 45 minutes of conversation today and then uh, 10, 15 minutes of questions afterwards. So I expect that there, there may be more questions today than on previous topics. A little bit about me. I have a small company called LB Design, and uh, we began in 2000, and we work with clients in the U.S. and the U.K., and a little bit in, in Central Africa. We work both with, with nonprofits and charities, as well as the, the commercial for-profit sector. And as, as you see in the slide there, uh, our primary role is, is making websites, but that really that's just part of the tool for online marketing. So what we do is we help organizations by building them websites that they can use as their primary marketing tool. And then we'll help them craft the strategy and implement the plan using their new website. So as far as today is concerned, we're going to talk about the following four items. We're going to talk about the value of having a content strategy, why it's necessary. And we'll talk about some key questions and considerations that you should be asking yourself and your colleagues during the, during the process of crafting a plan. Give you some advice and some, show some tips on following the plan. And then, of course, no marketing effort is, is really complete without spending some time measuring the success, looking at what worked, and making amendments to the plan so that we can change what didn't. So what we're not going to have time with today, because there are so many people registered and on the call today, we won't have time to get into what works for your organization. Because frankly, the, the strategy and plan that might work for you is not necessarily going to work for your for your colleague or your neighbor. So we, we just don't have time for that. And we won't also go into the nuts and bolts of search engine optimization. Any content strategy, content marketing strategy is going to rely somewhat on SEO, but we don't have time to get into the specifics of how that works and how best to organize that. Again, happy to entertain some basic questions on that, but we won't have time to get into detail. So is everybody ready? All right, let's go. I thought it makes sense to, to start with a definition of content marketing. What is it? What's, what's, a, what's a high level understanding? And I pulled this from a, uh, an organization called the Content Marketing Institute. And while I give you a few minutes to, to read that through, I just want to flag up that, that in, in simple terms, it's about generating content that matters to the people we want to reach. And as we can read in the last line 
of this of this quote is ultimately to drive profitable customer action. Now, obviously, as nonprofits and charities, we're not really focused on on profits, but we we do have some some other goals and targets that we can think about. So, before we get into what our goals and targets, let's try to rephrase that very formal definition of content marketing into something that that is perhaps a bit more practical and down to earth. And as you can read here, it's really about creating and sharing content, whether that's blog posts, maybe some white papers, imagery, podcasts even, maybe little videos, infographics, anything that can be shared easily online that will matter or make a difference or resonate with our intended audience. And, and we mean that in a good way. Uh, we don't want to disseminate content just to get notes. We want it to be a, considered a value and matter to our target audience. And so going back to that, that formal definition, that last line where we talked about not being profit-driven, well, what are some of the things that a charity or nonprofit may want to do? What could be an aim or a goal for content marketing? And initially, if we're a new organization, we might want to raise awareness. We might want to raise awareness about the community that we're serving, about their needs, about the specific plight of a group or an organization or an animal or a community. We might want to raise awareness about ourselves. We're new in the fight. We're just getting started. Here's our story. Here's why we care. Once we, we explain why we care, maybe we want to talk about how good we are at it or how, how we really know the topic well, establish ourselves as thought leaders in our particular sector or community. Uh, we have the experience, the knowledge, the empathy to address the particular concerns about which we're so passionate. We may want to distribute resources to to our community. So information for parents, it could be uh, white papers and how-tos, depending on what our audience is. It could be strategy papers that we want to share with with politicians and think tanks to try to get them to, to see our point of view. There's really no, no end to the types of resources that may, we may want to share. But the idea is that we can create that content, create those resources, and put it in a neat, packaged, well-packaged, easily distributed at a central location, our website, for sharing among our, our key audiences. Of course, every charity is going to want donations. We, we need money to, to make it happen. And having a, a content strategy that draws traffic to the site, that raises awareness about the cause and about the organization, and that puts, puts us and positions us as leading thinkers and doers in that particular fight or in that particular cause, is likely to increase donations, bring money in. We can also use our content strategy to recruit volunteers and staff. If we think back across this list we have here, if, if raising awareness and establishing ourselves as experts, that's going to make people want to work with us. We want to want people to help us out. And so we can use our content strategy to help drive towards those goals, none of which are, strictly speaking, profit-focused. Is everybody with me so far? No questions? Excellent. I'm going to grab a sip of tea and move on. I can't get the presentation to work right. There we go. Come on, computer, catch up. Okay, so how do how do we go about getting started with content marketing? You know, we we have some goals. How do how do we get off the off the block there? How do we get rolling? And as I was preparing this presentation, I was looking for a, a suitable quote about the value of a plan. And I had this thought in my head swirling around, and I couldn't find anybody to, to which the quote could be attributed. So I may claim it as my own, but uh, I'm not sure that it is. And really the thought is, when it comes to online marketing strategy, content strategy, any plan, provided that it's at least okay, if it's well executed, is almost always going to be better than just running forward with content with no planning. We're trying to implement a uh, a plan and a strategy 
over an extended period of time with really specific goals, really important targets. And if we don't have any plan in place, we're going to be more or less shoot, shooting from the hip. And that's not going to be very effective at best and could be hugely problematic at worst. So the goal then, the, the point, the takeaway here is have a plan. I said a good plan, well executed, is always, always better. Don't rush into it without a plan. Because I think we all have enough examples on, online of content that gets online that charities or even non-charities, for-profit companies, individuals put online that goes wayward, that causes problems, that wreaks havoc. And, and that often happens as a result of a failure to follow a plan. Uh, and so having a plan is helpful in helping us, at the very least, avoid mistakes and hopefully will help us maximize our efficiency and returns. So I've got a couple of slides here for the key questions that we want to, to ask ourselves and ask among our, our, our colleagues about when we're trying to create a plan. So what do we want to say? So what is it the message that we want to say? What do we have to say about a particular topic? And to whom do we want to say it? Who is our audience? Who are we trying to reach? And as we, we think about the message in the audience, obviously the two relate to each other. And what we think is a key and important message from our perspective, our target audience may not care about as much, or they have a slightly different angle or emphasis or focus on it. So when thinking about our message, we really do need to tie it to, or at least relate it to, the audience that we want to reach. And that may require some work and some energy to figure out what do they care about? What does that community think about this? Where are their specific needs today? And how can we address that? with a content, with resources, with information. And a related question very close to this is the tone. What We know roughly what we want to say. We've got our core message. We know who we want to say it to. But how do we go about saying that, right? Um, we can say it uh, gently and softly, or we can say it harshly and quickly and as kind of a with a sense of urgency. And we have to make sure that whatever tone that we take follows the brand that we've established or for a new organization that we are establishing. So these three are really the, the, the essence of, of a content strategy is what is the message, who is the audience, and what is the tone? And that tone needs to apply not only to written content, but also very much to image content as well or videos, whatever it might be. Tone has to be consistent across. So following on, the next set of questions is, how often do we want to say it? What is our publication schedule? How, how, how often are we going to write a blog post? How often can we create a how-to video? What's a realistic schedule for us to think about creating infographics? And just because it's the internet and social media in a lot of ways is quote unquote free, doesn't mean that it doesn't take time and energy to create the content to share. So our publication schedule needs to think, consider not only our, our human resources, but also what's going on in the community as well throughout the year. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through the, the talk today. Um, the next question here is to think about is distribution. Where do we want to say it? So where do we want to share our message? By and large, that's going to be on our, our own website. That's our primary distribution tool. But certainly, we can consider social media and other tools as well. And again, more about that in a bit. And then lastly, how are we going to share it? Obviously, social media is hugely popular and hugely valuable these days. But there are a couple other avenues that we may wish to consider. And we'll want to be very strategic in thinking about social media and how we want to share that. So if we start to dissect some of those questions a little bit, and we start with messaging, 
So what causes or topics matter most to our community? And you'll, re you'll recall that I said that we, we really want to make sure it's what matters most to them and not what we think matters to them or what we think should matter to them. We really need to make sure that not just from a content strategy, content marketing strategy standpoint, but also from delivering services, we really do know what matters to our communities. We need to make sure that we, we're aware of that and so that the people responsible for generating content for our content strategy are aware of that and can communicate those concerns effectively online. And then once we're aware of these concerns and topics that matter to them, we have to consider what, what do we know about those topics. Many, many charities online today here on, on the call are addressing all sorts of different needs, all sorts of different causes. And there are a number of different ways to address different causes, but are we more clinical and scientific uh, in our approach? Or are we empathetic and built around support? Or are we a hands-on kind of charity that addresses the immediate problem with practical solutions what, what, where is our, our knowledge? Where is our expertise? And how then can we tailor our message to make sure that we're conveying our expertise, adding value for our communities, but also taking a constructive part in the conversation that's happening online around the topics we're conversing on? Identifying target audience can be a, a real challenge, and this takes some time, because we need to think about what we want to say and to whom, and we need to realize that there can be multiple key audiences. For example, we may be trying to alleviate a particular hazard for a disadvantaged group in, say, you know, the southern uh, United States. and so one key community is, in fact, that particularly disadvantaged group in the southern United States. But another group might be the senators and representatives at both the, the state and the local level of those southern states that can help through legislation and awareness address those disadvantages. And that would be a different key audience. And maybe a third key audience, key audience is the, the general public, us, who I live in Philadelphia, I'm not in the southern state, but certainly I would be interested in knowing about and seeing what I could do to help disadvantaged communities in the southern states. So you know, I might be a member of a third key audience. And, and so that charity that's looking to help that disadvantaged group really needs to spend some time thinking about who they're trying to communicate, with whom they're trying to communicate, and why and what do they want to say to them. There are some, some helpful different tools around that. One of the more popular and more valuable is, is to use personas and content map mapping in connection with that, those personas. And in just a nutshell, what, what that means is thinking about the, the community. So using our example of a, of a nonprofit that helps a disadvantaged group in the southern United States, who is a member of that, of that, that a disadvantaged group? What do they look like? What are, what are their demographics? What are their immediate needs? What's their family condition? What you know, that kind of getting very much that granular detail? With we're in the in the trenches every day, helping them, working with them, so we know them. Let's let's describe somebody. Almost make them like a real character in a play or in a movie that we can that has real needs, and and then we can start to think about and think from that person's perspective. And say, well, if, if if that person has these specific needs, these are likely to be the the content, the topics, the concerns that they have. And you know, we can do that if we don't have many resources. We can do that as a theoretical exercise. If we we have some time and some energy and the capacity to do so, we could always reach out to the, the that immediate audience and ask them some questions, talk about their needs, and that way we have real input, real feedback, real research from real people about that, about their concerns and their needs. So we can really identify that, that target audience. And the last point here on, on this slide is to talk about meeting our target audiences where they are. So it's all well and good 
if we want to share images on Pinterest, but it doesn't do a lot of good if our demographics, the community that we're trying to reach, doesn't use Pinterest in any kind of great number. We're spending time and energy somewhere talking in a place where no one's going to listen. So we need to think about and figure out where that audience is going to be. Are they on Facebook? Are they on Twitter? Do they get updates on a regular basis from LinkedIn? And, and making sure that we are strategic in where we distribute our information, where we distribute our target messaging so that when we do go to the trouble and the effort of generating content, it's likely to be seen and consumed by those target audiences. Setting the tone is difficult to do consistently over time. It really, really is hard. And I say that because if you think about it, you just get out of the box, you're really excited, you've got a brand new content marketing strategy and you're really eager to get started. So you're writing some blog posts, you're crafting a white paper, you're doing the research around that and you're eager, you're excited and you've been given the time and space to get that done. But over time then, the other needs of the organization begin to press and we have to do more with less time. And so we might cut corners and the like. And that's really over time where keeping that tone consistent is difficult. So we really have to pay attention to that. And we have to make sure that we're paying attention to the tone, not only of the written copy, but also of the images. Are the photos of the community that we're serving, are the, is that representative of the way that we see the community, that we try to help the community? Is that representative of the way that we want the community to be seen? And it's worth it to spend some time in that initial strategy document writing down your guidelines for tone. How do we describe the people that we serve? How do we not describe them? What words do we avoid? What words do we think are not appropriate and used to use when describing our community, our clients, the people that we help? How do we talk about our audience? How do we talk about the, the change we're trying to affect? Just a few bullet points at the very least that, that set out these guidelines are very, very helpful, particularly over time, and particularly as your organization grows, if you bring in somebody else into the to help with the marketing efforts, there is this existing guideline that, 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 that they can have and use as a reference to say, oh, we don't describe it like that. We don't talk about it that way. We take this angle. We focus on this. We downplay that and we upplay this because we think it sets the right tone. So that's, that's, that's a really important part of that planning document that should not be overlooked. So we have a publication schedule, and that's really, I mean, it is, it is exactly what it says. And it's really just a calendar of what we're going to publish, where we're going to publish that, and when we're going to do so. And so for the sake of argument, we, in our strategy session, we decided we wanted to write one blog post a month on our charity site. So for the month of June coming up, we we're going to have four weeks. I don't think there's five weeks in June this year. Um, so, or at least, you know, how it wraps around. Starts the fifth week sometime. Um, what we might want to say is, okay, for the first week, we're going to continue that series that we started in April. So it's going to be the, the, the third post in a series about the topic that we've been exploring. And, and, and really diving deeply into. And then on the, the second week, we know that we've got a, a big event in our community uh, in June that we wanna leave that week open to write some kind of reaction piece to whatever that big event is, whatever that big webinar or seminar or conference might be so that we can share our thoughts on what's happening that week. So we know we're gonna write about that conference or that, that big event, we just don't know what we're gonna say. And in the third week, maybe we're trying to recruit volunteers. So part of our strategy is to do a, a day in the life or a focus on a particular volunteer and to talk about their duties and why they care about our organization and why they find helping uh, the people that we help, why they find that rewarding. And then that last, that last post might, that last post of the month might be something different, but we really need to plot that out. And, and we need to do it 
for the full calendar year, and we need to be as specific as we can, but still leave room for spontaneity. If we think about our example calendar for June, we knew we wanted to write something about about that big uh, event in June, that big industry workshop or whatever it, may, it might have been. So we, we know exactly what it's going to be about. We just don't know the specific angle or, or target. So that's okay. And when we also said we wanted to write about a volunteer. Well, we might not choose until May which volunteer we write about, but we know we're going to do a volunteer. So we, we've got enough specificity to make it clear what our task is, what we're trying to achieve, but enough room for that spontaneity to, you know, if the volunteer who we had wrote, written about in June, or I'm sorry, selected to write about in January is, is now off on another project that might not be around, so we might not want to choose that or um, does that make sense everybody to follow? Let me know if you've got a question and I'll try to address it here. Looks like we're okay. I think everyone's with me. All right. So in addition to thinking about what we're going to write about and when, we really should be thinking about what is the business calendar of our organization? And by that, I mean what events and concerns change as the calendar year rolls through. So what matters to your audience in January and in February and March? Is there something particular about the spring that is important for you to be focusing on within your content? Is it, you know, maybe it's a particular anniversary out of an event that uh, has great meaning to your community? Or, you know, maybe um, there's a big race, a big fundraiser in August, and you want to focus a lot of attention around your content strategy in the months up to that. Or you know, maybe you're, you're a charity that helps people with housing concerns and emergency situations, and you know that those concerns are clearly going to be more dire in the winter months. What should we be thinking about, writing about, talking about in our content strategy? in the run-up to those winter months. So making sure that the topics that we're choosing are relevant to the time that we're, we're going to be publishing them. If we think about distributing the content that we have, that we've generated, I've said this now for, I guess this is the third webinar in a row, uh, I'm sure Sarah will correct me if I'm wrong on that, that we really do want our website to be our primary publication tool. And as I said earlier in this conversation, the, the point behind that is, is, is both strategic and practical. It's strategic in that we have the most functionality and design control over our own website. We, we, we decide what it's going to look like and what it's going to do. Yeah, I appreciate that that budgets fit into that, and we may not have the wherewithal to design the real website that we want. But within our, 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 our budgetary limits, we decide what's going to happen and how it's going to look. And we just don't have that with third-party websites. We just don't have that with Facebook and with Twitter. And we see that you know, Twitter used to offer RSS feeds of content. No, they don't. They used to allow easy embedding of Twitter streams via their API, and then they changed that a little bit as well. And, and Facebook used to offer tabs, and then they stopped that. And they, then they started introducing more advertising. And you need to advertise in order or pay money to get your posts to be distributed to your entire following. So these kinds of changes for these social media sites just leave us outside of immediate control. And if we each focus on our own website, we'll always have and that's, that's really why we're doing um, making that choice. And as I said, it, we have to use social media. We have to use it strategically. We have to use it tactically. We don't have too much time and energy to spend on it. And we want to make sure that the time and energy that we do put into it is well done and wisely, wisely distributed. So looking at your, going back to your target audiences is where is your target audience? Um, where are people? in your demographics of concern congregating, so to speak, on the internet. Um, this next point is 
looking to kind of capitalize on different ways that we can share our content outside of our own social media sites and our own website. And for example, there may be a, a charity in across town from you that that deals with the same topic in a slightly different way, but you like what they're doing, you appreciate the work that they're putting in, and while it's not your approach, it's still effective and it is benefiting the community that you're both trying to serve. Well, maybe there's a way to, to share some content, to write a blog post for them, to share a white paper on their website that demonstrates your point of view, your thoughts, your approach, and not necessarily that they have to be philosophical differences. Somebody could just be more clinical versus more supportive and uh, community-oriented. And you're then building links with that with that charity. You're ensuring that their supporters, their communities, their target audiences know about you and your community. And there's there's a way to further get your information out. And if you're writing good content, if you're generating valuable infographics, if you're putting together solid podcasts, everybody's looking for content. So if you were to go to them and uh, share some information, give it to them for free, just in the spirit of community, that's likely to, to, to be well received. Um, and the other outlets I think we can think about local media, and not everything has to be the Associated Press or CNN or BBC or something like that. There may be a, a local news news outlet that, that would be willing to run a letter to the editor or a guest post from, from your chief executive or your head of research or head of programs or something like that. Um, it could be that uh, there's a local community center that, allow, that has a a blog and your group meets at that community center, so they're willing to give you a guest blog post. And again, if you're creating good content, people are going to want to use it and share it and make sure that their their key audiences are able to see and benefit from that as well. So I know I said that we we weren't going to go into social media in any kind of great detail, and we're still not. But I do want to take take a minute just to make sure that we realize that that people will share our content if we make it easy for them to do so. So if we write a white paper, and let's say it has some pictures in it, let's make sure that that white paper isn't a 15 megabyte PDF. That's difficult to email. It might get blocked. It's certainly going to take a long time to download or open even. So if somebody tweets it on their phone and another person follows that tweet and clicks on the link, if it's a 15 megabyte PDF, it's not going to download quickly on the phone. And that, that opportunity to impress or engage with that, and that new audience via Twitter is lost. So we want to make sure that when we're putting things out, we're doing so in a way that um, makes it easy to share. Our videos, if appropriate, really don't need to be much longer than just a few minutes. Um, yes, if we're creating something that calls for a longer video, that's fine and that's important to do. But being just be aware of that 90 seconds, 30 seconds, a minute and a half, two minutes can be enough to convey your message or at least to convey the key aspect of your message but still hold the attention span of somebody who might just be clicking on a link rather than a committed follower. So it's keeping your content very tight and accessible and easily shared so that people are willing to spend the entire time considering your message and maybe going on and learning more. And again, I'll, I'll, I'll say it here, it's, it's on the bullet point, I'll mention it over, over the internet here, is having a social media strategy as it corresponds to your content marketing strategy is a really important so thinking about how are we going to tweet, where are we going to share our information, what social media outlets are we going to use, which tools are we going to use to control that is all very, very important and well worthwhile. So this is a graphic that, that I've shared on a previous webinar or two, and it's one that we put together at LB Design, and it's a visual representation of how we craft our online marketing strategies. I'm 
particular content marketing strategy where the bulk of the content is going to go on our website. And then we will share that content, try to entice people to that content via the clouds that you see there. Now I've just put in five clouds there, but there are certainly other social media outlets that would be worth using uh, depending on your immediate situation. And then we use that blue ring to kind of further conversation. So we have a lot of people that follow our blogs via RSS. We email them. And I mean that in kind of, a, sorry, say the good old fashioned sense of email where somebody on our, in our team has written a blog post about a particular topic. And we have a contact that we know is very, very interested in that, that topic. And in fact, we were just having a coffee, coffee a couple of weeks ago with that contact. And so we take the time to grab the link off our website, pop it into an email, and send it as a per with a personal message to our firm. Hi, Mary, I know we had coffee a couple of weeks and we were talking about this, and you know your story really stuck with me. And just this morning, uh, our, our, our Elizabeth from the marketing department drafted or published this blog post, and I thought it would really resonate with you based on what we said. Here's the link. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you find it a guide. You know, that kind of thing, taking the time to share it directly. Uh, E-newsletters is very valuable. Comments on blog posts, although that's getting increasingly less common as the spammers of the world have taken that over. Comments are much more likely to happen via social media. The conversation or the content might be generated on a blog, but then the conversation flows across social media. And just other forms of feedback that we'll want to keep an eye on whether it's emails to us, phone calls that we receive, conversations at a board meeting, conversations on an event world. Uh, so this is kind of the ebb and flow and, and of content. And maybe, you know, if we do have a video, we'll, we'll put it on YouTube and we'll promote it there and take advantage of YouTube as a search engine. But we also might want to draft a blog post around the content of that video, the message of that video. And pull that video into a blog post on our own website. Or maybe we'll share a link to that video on Facebook or on Twitter. Does that make sense? Does everyone kind of see how it's kind of this nebulous cloud and we have to be strategic about where and how we share things and the best way to do that is just spending time thinking about it and coordinating and working it up with our colleagues? Okay. Don't seem to have any questions, so we'll, we'll keep rolling on that. So how do we make sure that we, we follow our strategy and plan? That's, that's always a tricky thing, right, with, with marketing, is we get excited about the possibilities, we get excited about the plan, but it's day-to-day, uh, month-to-month, year-to-year implementation that gets a challenge. And in my years of experience, I think the most important bit of advice that I can share is to make sure that marketing is a priority for the management of your organization. If the CEO or the executive director is supportive of your efforts to do a content marketing strategy, she will give you the time, give you the space to create that content, to implement that content. And if she's not committed to it, you'll probably notice that when you're given loads of other tasks to do and don't have the time and space to, to make the marketing a priority. So that's really a, a big, big key is make sure that there is board level and management level buy-in. And if you are the manager or you are a board member, make sure that you communicate that support for marketing. You could be doing the most valuable bit of work in the world, in your sector, in your area, in your community, but if you're not telling people about it, if you're not sharing that news, it's going to be difficult to grow awareness about your organization. It's going to be difficult to fundraise. It's going to be difficult to apply for grants if no one knows about you. So you have to make marketing a priority. Not the overarching priority. It shouldn't take the place of services and support for your community, but it needs to be a key aspect of what you're trying to achieve. When thinking about our calendar, it's invariable that, that we're going to get very busy, particularly at the time of the year when we have our major events and functions in our key focus area in our industry or in our sector. So we'll want to write 
evergreen content well in advance. And by evergreen, I mean just that. It's just like a pine tree whose needles stay dark and green all year round. So going back to the example we talked about earlier of, of being a charity that focuses on housing for those in immediate need, well, we know that every winter there's going to be a certain set of weather-related concerns that come up. Well, there's no reason that we can't write that blog post or that white paper or that bit of content now in May, in June, when we have the time, when we're when it's at a slower period. Those concerns aren't going to go away in the three or four months. That content really is evergreen. So we can we can write it now. We might need to dust it off and add some relevant examples. Maybe there's a story in the news as we're going to, as our production publication calendar hits that time of the year, there's a story in the news that we want to reference in the blog post. But then we're spending 5, 10, 15 minutes integrating that in to the introduction or in somewhere into the post without having to write the whole thing. So the more that we can generate these evergreen bits of content at our slower time means that when we get busy, we just pull them off the shelf and slot them into the production timetable. And that's exactly why we have that timetable. We know we're going to be busy in the autumn. Let's write these things now when we have time. And just like any marketing plan, it has to be reviewed regularly. You have to make sure that you're following it. Um, I know from my own experience, the plans I made in January, I may or may not have a completely accurate view or understanding of them by the time the end of May rolls around. So opening up the document, pulling it off the shelf, and just reading through it again to make sure that I am still staying on focus and on target. The content that I'm generating is geared towards that goal of maybe it's raising awareness, maybe it's establishing thought leadership, maybe we're really trying to grow our volunteer base. Yeah, we've written, of the 12 posts we've written so far this year, seven of them have been about volunteering and volunteering activities and a day in the life of this volunteer or that volunteer. So it's really helpful to go back and make sure that we're following the plan just by pulling out the plan and reviewing it, reading it, double checking. So this, this next slide is, is particularly relevant for people who are new to online marketing, is that it can take a long time to generate results that are consistent and consistently measurable. If we're relying on search engine optimization for organic search results around a topic about which we're writing and blogging, it's going to take some time for Google to notice that and for us to gain some traction, depending on how specific an area um, and search engine-ly competitive, search engine, I just think I just made that an adverb, search engine-ly competitive that area or that topic is, it can take a fair amount of time and energy to get there. So we have to be aware of that so we don't get discouraged after six or eight weeks saying, oh, we're writing, we're writing, we're writing, but we're not seeing a jump in any kind of traffic. What's going on? Well, maybe we need to use the anecdotal wins to, to support our, our efforts and to help us see whether or not we're heading in the right direction. Maybe we write a blog post that didn't get a lot of overall traffic in terms of organic search, but maybe it got a fair amount of promotion on social media. Uh, Twitter seemed to like what we write about. It hit a chord, and instead of the, the average visit we get is three or four visits from Twitter, this month we got 18 or 35 or 200 or whatever the case may be. And just note, those that, you know, those are – marketing wins that you wouldn't have unless you were getting doing content strategy. And you can use that to feed back into your to your strategy. Every time we write about this topic, no, we're not doing a lot in terms of organic. It's a very competitive market, very competitive sector, but we do get a lot on social media. Maybe when we should think about tweaking our social media campaign around that particular area or that particular topic and use our content strategy campaign to generate the content that can drive that social media strategy forward. Does that make sense? Somebody with that? And as I said earlier, it can take months to 
develop meaningful, measurable results. So anything in marketing is, is worth doing for a period of time. I like to make sure that our clients do anything for at least three months, preferably six, before we decide to stop it. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be tweaking and, and fine-tuning for the first three months or for the first six months, but we just have to keep at it because we just, you know, we might have caught people on a bad month. We might caught people on the, the wrong time of the year. We might have uh, had a bit of a learning curve around generating content that is going to connect, and it took us some time to learn how to do that. So we have to give it some time for it to work. We have to allow the, the seed some time to grow. So then if, if we're thinking about success, how do we measure it? Well, we have to study what works, and we have to amend accordingly. So we talked earlier about managing those anecdotes or looking at those anecdotes of, of, of feedback and Twitter activity and maybe LinkedIn activity. And where it's not enough to draw any kind of trending conclusions, but to at least use to, to fine tune and at least confirm or maybe shave a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right what we're doing. Going back and amending that plan. Not 180 degrees another way, but just fine tuning. We want to look at our our reports, our Google reports, and see what is drawing visitors to the site. At the very least we should be pulling in traffic on a search for our charity name, but obviously we want to get beyond that. So what is pulling people into the site? What are people searching for? But equally important is, is what's not drawing people to the site. If we're really focused on a particular aspect or a particularly uh, unique set of phrases or circumstances, and we're, we know from, from, from Google that searches for that content is happening, people are searching for that, and they're not coming to our site, we need to figure out why because we're not writing about it, we're not writing about it enough, we're not focused on it on our social media, why is that happening? And I'll share some specific tools for measuring in, in just the next slide. But once we know what is drawing people in, then we might want to consider going more deeply into those popular topics. If you know, we do a five reasons to do X, as it pertains to our particular cause, and that just gets a lot of traffic. Everyone's always searching. Well, maybe we then write five separate blog posts that dive into each one of those reasons. And then we have content, whether we do it over five weeks or we do it over five months, we have to think about, but we're, we're, we're taking that topic that is proving so popular and really expanding on it, really going into a, a deeper dive on it to try to bring more value and more information to our key audience. So how do we how do we measure tools? How do we measure the activity and the search words and the functionality and the tweets and all that kind of stuff? Well, one of the better tools, the best ones for your own website, uh, are Google Analytics and Webmaster tools. Also, and these are conversations entirely to to themselves, much longer than we have time for. Um, but you want to look at those, and they'll give you information about activity uh, in terms of numbers, but also in terms of searches and what are bringing, what words are bringing people to your site. For social media, there's a whole suite of different tools, no pun intended. Hootsuite is a social media management tool. There are link shorteners like Bitly, where you can um, track what links of, that you share people people click on. And there's 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 a lot more, but if you if you look at social media measurement tools, if you Google that, you'll get a number of different recommendations. Again, there's there's so many different options, and some are cost, uh, some are free, some have have, have have service fees. So you have to do a little bit of research into to what is what is right for you. But you absolutely have to measure. You absolutely have to see what's working and what's not, especially with online marketing. That's one of the real benefits of online marketing. So what are our takeaways today? Is we we need a thorough plan to successfully implement a content marketing strategy. We really have to take the time to get that plan 
at least good. Obviously, excellent is great, but I, I like to say that we don't want excellent to become the enemy of good. It's got to be good, um, but we just need to get it done and start to implement it. We can tweak and measure as we go. I've shared with you the some key questions to be asking yourselves and your colleagues to make sure that you get the strategy that actually is right, that will work, that's not just drawn from your own heads, but you're trying to get out there and engage with the community and learn more, as much about them in a practical way so that you can share messages and information that is most likely to resonate and be of value. You have to follow your plan. You've got to follow it. You've got to follow it for at least three months, hopefully six. And hopefully in that time frame, you'll be seeing enough wins and getting enough returns on your investment of time and money that you'll be able to, to drive forward with your plan for another three to six. And then lastly, you have to measure your returns. You have to look at what's working, and you have to look at what's not, and make sure that you eliminate that which isn't working and capitalize on what, what did generate value for your organization. And as I look at the time here again, I see that uh, my efforts to try to limit myself to about 40 minutes were probably closer to 45 or 48. So I'm going I'm to wrap it up formally now, and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions that anyone may have if they'd like to share with them via the, uh, the chat box. Hi, Liam. I'm just jumping back in here. I will leave the presentation open for the next five to ten minutes, just in case anybody has any last-minute questions. If you do, please enter them in the chat window now so Liam can see them. I'll monitor them as well, just in case you accidentally send them to me. Um, aside that, thank you all for joining us today. Um, again, my name is Sarah, and I'm from Tech Impact. Thanks, Liam, for your presentation. You did a great job. Um, we will have a recording available shortly after we finish up this presentation. So please email me if you would like me to forward it to you. It may be helpful just to have on file to share with colleagues or friends, whoever you'd like. Thanks, everybody. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Much appreciated.